needs translation? Has? Yes. Yes? Okay. So thank you very much for coming. So we, we've published uh, a new book, and I brought 40 copies to Slovenia, and I only have three left. <laughs> I, I didn't expect to sell that many. So I, I only have three copies left now. Um, those of you who want a copy and can't get it here, it is on Amazon as print and Kindle and also Audible. So it's on iTunes and Audible and it's on Amazon as an audio book. Um, but those of you who would like a copy, now you can get it at the end of the class. So this is a, a fictional story, a novel, of the journey from ordinary life to full enlightenment in Krishna consciousness. And the story is based upon a series of metaphors taken from three sources. One is from the uh, Bhagavatam, also called the Bhagavat Purana. Uh, one is from uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, an incarnation of Krishna. And the other is from a great saint of about 500 years ago named Das Goswami, or Raghunath Das Goswami. So I'm not going to tell you the story. I'm not going to ruin the story for you. But I will be going through the metaphors, the allegories, that form the basis for the story. Okay. So we start out with a personality called Jeddah. And that was not his real name. Jeddah means stupid, foolish, dull, idiot, basically. And he was called this name by his half-brothers and by the other children. And it kind of stuck as his name. He's a very interesting person because I'm sure you've heard of child prodigies, like Mozart was a child prodigy in music. So Jeddah was a child prodigy in enlightenment. By the time he was one or two years old, he was already fully enlightened. And sometimes, as we know, uh, great persons who are enlightened, they may go to a monastery where they take a vow of silence but that was a little difficult for Jeddah at the age of one or two years old. So he went to a monastery internally, and he didn't speak to anybody for his whole life. He acted like he could hardly hear or see. Huh? And he basically tolerated everything. And one day he decided to speak. A great king was passing on the road in a palanquin. One of the palanquin carriers became sick. The king forced Jeddah into slavery to carry the palanquin. But Jeddah wouldn't step on any bugs on the road. So the palanquin was shaking. And when the king came and said, Why are you shaking my palanquin? Then Jeddah said, I'm going to tell you a story. He said, The soul is originally spiritual and belongs to the spiritual atmosphere. But when a soul wants to try to enjoy separately from the spirit, it enters into this material world, which is like a great forest for enjoyment. In this forest of enjoyment, the souls who have forgotten their spiritual nature look at the items of the forest and try to figure out what they could get to sell and make a profit. So that's why I start my story with merchants in a forest looking at everything in the forest to sell in a city and make a profit. Oh, there's some fruit I could gather and sell. There's some valuable wood. There are some seeds. There are some spices. Here are things I can gather to make a profit. So such is the essential mentality of a materialist. A materialistic person looks around at the world and says, what's in it for me? How can I make a profit? How can I exploit the things of the world and the people of the world and the beings of the world for my own enjoyment? 
And Jetta said, we do this not only as human beings, but we also do it in various species of life. That we take birth as fish, as insects, as plants, as trees, as men, as women, and even higher beings with bodies made mostly of light. But in each of these forms, our mood is, how can I exploit the world to get some gain for myself? Now sometimes in this great forest of enjoyment, we meet a honeybee. The honeybee, Jeddah says, is a metaphor for a saintly person. So why do you think he uses a honeybee as a metaphor for a saintly person? Hmm? They are always gathering nectar, yes. They are taking the essence of the flowers. Uh, they are always gathering the nectar. So if we are lucky enough to meet an enlightened person, a saintly person, in the form of a honeybee in this great forest of enjoyment, then such a saintly person, such an enlightened being, will tell us how we can also be experiencing at every moment the essential nectar of life. But such enlightened beings are also going to tell us what is the nature of living a materialistic life. So the next metaphors from Jeddah are going to be about what is the world like for a materialist? And this is a very sad part of the story, so please don't get discouraged because it gets better, okay? So just stick, stick with me here, okay? These are, these are kind of heavy, sad metaphors. So the first one is about the mosquitoes and the flies. So if you've ever tried sleeping with a mosquito, right? And all night you're just hitting yourself, yes? and you can't get any sleep. So this is a metaphor for the people who criticize us. Zzz, you have so many problems. Zzz, you're not very nice. Zzz, you have to make so many changes in yourselves. Zzz, why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> then we have the crows, the locusts. Do you know how to translate locusts? Are you translating? Who's translating? Where's our translator? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're translating. Do you know the Slovenian word for locusts? Yes? Yes, okay. So there's crows, there's locusts, and there's rats. And this is a metaphor for when we work hard for something, and right when we're ready to enjoy it, it gets taken away. Right? You work hard for weeks or months or years on something, and someone else gets the credit. Right? Or you work for something, your boss tells you, I want you to do this, and you really throw your heart into it, and after you finish, your boss says, you know, we really didn't need that anyway. I used to live in a home with a cherry tree, and we were watching the cherries, and the birds were also watching the cherries. <laughs> then we have fatigue, hunger, and thirst. So when we are tired, hungry, and thirsty, then often we are unkind even to those people that we love. Just some small disturbance. Those of you who are familiar with the Bhagavatam know that Emperor Parikshit was insulting to the great sage Sonika just because the emperor was hungry, tired, and thirsty. So a little disturbance in our physical body and we can become unkind even to people that we care about. Then there are the castles in the sky. This is a metaphor for the things we want in life that we never get. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want a beautiful wife, a handsome husband. I want wonderful children. I want a beautiful house right on the ocean. And maybe we never get those things. We want them, we want them, we want them, we want them, we work for them, we try. And there are certain things in life, there are desires, and we just don't get them. It's like this mirage of a castle in the sky. Then sometimes there's a swamp or a marsh, and from this wetland there are vapors or gases. And sometimes these gases glow, they're like phosphorescent, 
and they may look like gold. So this is a metaphor for things we want and we get. But when we get them, we find that they're not what we expected. Maybe you get that wonderful husband, but then he's not so wonderful. Or I have a friend who worked for so many years to be a lawyer. So much study, so much time, so much money. And then she discovered she didn't like being a lawyer. So the things that we work for, we get them, and then we're like, Mm, this wasn't what I really wanted. And then we may look for relief in various systems that appear to be religion and spirituality, but are really systems that are cheating. Just like, I don't know if you have them in this country, but where I'm from in America, we have these people who claim to be Christians, but they say the purpose of Christianity is to become rich. And if you want to be rich, send me your money. Just send me five dollars. Oh, now send me another fifty. Oh, now another two hundred. And if you keep sending me your money, someday you'll be rich like me. I'm so rich, I can buy my own airplane. <laughs> huh? So this is just like trying to cool off by jumping in a very shallow river and underneath are sharp rocks. When you jump in such a river, you simply break your bones. So, so many systems that appear to be religion or spirituality, but are really more like teaching a system of, of false magic. And then we may find ourselves in a storm. It could be a dust storm, a rainstorm, a snowstorm, where we cannot see clearly. I'm sure we've all sometimes been driving and it's such a bad storm that you can't see, yeah? Have you had this experience? So this is like when someone has such strong sexual desires that they lose their intelligence. I'm sure we all know of somebody, maybe it's ourselves, who has such strong desires that someone gets involved with the wrong person Right? And we say, why are you with this person? Not a good person. Oh, but I love him. I love her. Right? And they can't see. Then there are the crickets. The crickets make noise, but you can't see them. And the owls are the silent hunters. Uh, so these are like uh, enemies, and we don't really know who they are or where they are. Something like, you know, somebody comes to you and says, because I'm your really good friend, I, I think I should tell you something. Yeah, there's a lot of people here that you know, and they're saying that you have a lot of problems, and you know you really have to deal with these problems. Oh, really? Well, what problems are they saying that I have? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. That's c confidential. Well, 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 who's saying this? I mean, maybe I could talk to them and, and try to fix I'm, I'm sorry, I can't tell you who's saying this. It's confidential. And then your mind is going and thinking, what did I do? What did I say? Who is saying things? Right? We become so disturbed. Then there's the snakes. The snakes are a metaphor for the enemies who actually harm us. And actually, they don't just say bad things about us, but they actually harm us. Then there are the very steep mountains covered with thorns. These are like so many ceremonies and events that, you know, you don't really want to go. I don't really want to go to Aunt Sally's anniversary party. Okay. Hi, Aunt Sally. So nice to see you. Or well, sometimes we organize the events, you know, and we have to spend all this money, and we're thinking, okay, i got to invite him. And I have to invite him, and they don't talk to each other. And, right? So it's so difficult, like these very steep mountains covered with thorn. Then we have the metaphor of the cannibalistic demons. So these are the government tax collectors. So we've worked very hard for our money, and the government takes way too much in taxes and just puts that tax money in their own pockets. So they're like cannibals eating their own people. Then we have an attack from a hive. And this is a metaphor for adultery. And someone tries to enjoy uh, someone else's husband, someone else's wife. 
This is like you're trying to steal uh, someone else's honey and you get attacked. Then there's the metaphor of the python. This is a metaphor for sleep. Not just physical sleep, but spiritual sleep. The python first stops the heart. And in the same way, when someone is spiritually asleep, it's like their heart is not active, their, their heart is not open, they're closed and they're asleep, as if they've been uh, strangled by a python. And after all this trouble, there is the lion of death who comes and takes everything away. All right, we'll finish with the really sad part. Uh, after these metaphors, the king Rahugana said to Jada, I want to give up materialistic life. I want to find the essence of life. So for this, we are going to turn to the metaphors of Lord Chaitanya, who is an avatar of Krishna. These are metaphors that he told to his student, uh, Sanatana Goswami. He says, when you go to seek the essence of life, you must be very careful. Because there are teachers of genuine religious systems and genuine spirituality, but although their system is genuine, their presentation is not. So this is different from the shallow rivers where you didn't even have a genuine system. Here you have a genuine system, but the people teaching it have become bewildered, as if they are under a spell from one or two witches. So that witch over there on the right, that is the witch called Bukti, and the witch on the left is the witch called Mukti. So the witch of Bukti on the right is covered with coins. And this witch says, worship God, take up spirituality, take up religion, so that you will be happy in the world and go to heaven. Use God and use spirituality so that you will gain great prosperity and great fame and great power. And the witch called Mukti says, take up spirituality, take up religion, so that you can find your own freedom, that you can merge with the light and lose your identity and be free of all material trouble. So neither of these are the purpose of a genuine spiritual path. A genuine spiritual purpose is love for the divine. But when people take a real spiritual path and they're haunted by these two witches, their presentation becomes distorted. Most people teaching some sort, system of religion or spirituality in the world today, in whatever tradition, are haunted by one of these witches. Now, of course, we should have great love for these teachers of religion and spirituality because at some level, they are seeking the essence of life, even though they're seeking the essence of life for an ulterior motive. And what is beautiful is that eventually the desire for the essence will conquer over these various spells. But for now, if we're looking for the essence, we're not going to go someplace where we'll be haunted by witches. So we go to a fortune teller, Sarvagya, the one who knows everything, and he says, yes, the essence of life is there for you. It's a great treasure. In fact, you have a relative who left you this treasure as your inheritance and buried it somewhere in the city. But because he died without telling you, you don't know where it is. You could look for it in the northern part of the city, but then you have to be careful of the snakes. You could look for the essence of life in the western part of the city, but then you have to be careful of the nature spirits. You could look for it in the southern part of the city, but then you have to be careful of the giant wasps, the giant hornets. You can look for it in the eastern part of the city, but then you must be careful of the crazy elephants. So we're going to first look for the essence of life, the treasure uh, left to us in the northern part of the city. Now in, this, in the northern part of the city, the system for finding the essence of life is mechanical. It involves mastery of the body and the mind and the senses. Usually such persons follow strict rules of behavior and they have certain postures of sitting or even standing. They stand in a certain way that changes the workings of their body. 
Then they breathe in a certain way that changes the life air, and they regulate the circles of energy within the body. By doing this, they put their mind in a state of peace and stillness. And in that state, they can realize the essence of life. Now sometimes what happens when people do these systems is they also awaken innate powers within each of us, but these powers may distract them. But the bigger problem is that when people do this system right, they awaken a snake. This is a snake of cosmic energy. But sometimes what happens is people get devoured by this snake. In fact, some people even desire to be devoured by this snake. And on waking up this snake, they lose themselves, they lose their identity, and they fail to find the essence of life. One may look for the essence of life in the western part of the city. Here one will try to find the essence through understanding nature maybe by studying the philosophy and the great religious scriptures of the world, maybe by being a scientist and studying chemistry and mathematics, physics, maybe by studying the soft sciences like sociology and psychology, somehow to try to examine the world and philosophy. And if I can understand what's going on, I can become detached, I can realize I'm the observer, and I can discover the essence of life. But the problem is that nature's secrets are guarded by nature's spirits. In Sanskrit, they're called yakshas. Here you can see a yaksha. In Iceland, they're called the hudufuk. And the Icelandic people, even the government, take them very seriously. Even the Icelandic government, if they're going to build a road or a new building, uh, they always first make sure they're not going to disturb the hudufuk. So in every society, it's known that there are these spirits who guard the mountains and the forests and the rivers, and they also guard the secrets of nature. And they confuse the mind of people who try for, in this system of understanding the essence of life. So one may come up with one theory, okay, everything's like this. Now I'm really going to understand what things are like. I'll become detached from trying to enjoy the world. Oh, but then there's these things that one's theory doesn't explain. Or then they have to have another theory to explain these things. And this theory and this theory, they, they contradict each other. Oh, and then there's these things that neither of these theories explain. And then they have to have another theory. And these theories all contradict each other. And so there'll be a moment of certainty. Oh, I understand. And then again, confusion. And one becomes bewildered and misses the essence of life. One may look for the essence of life in the southern part of the city. Here one tries to find the essence through detached work. One does the kind of work and activities that one would normally do as a materialist, but doesn't try to enjoy them. Rather, takes the results of those activities and offers them to the divine for the sake of liberation. Now, in one sense, this is a much easier process than trying to find the essence through knowledge or through mastery, because you get to do what you would do anyway, except for a higher purpose. It's a little difficult, though, because normally we work to enjoy what we do, and this time you have to work and give up what you would want to enjoy. So it kind of goes counter to our instinctual way of being. But here the real danger is from the huge wasps, and I don't know how well you can see, but in the top right picture, that very big wasp is on a finger. So the wasp is about this big. Uh, these are the uh, giant wasps that live in Bengal, and this metaphor was given by uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he was in Bengal, so he was referring to these, these huge wasps. Now, Wasps are the natural enemy of the honeybee. And you remember who the honeybee is? Who's the honeybee? Yes. So the honeybees in, in a group can kill the wasps, and the wasps can kill the bees. Now, the wasps are also social creatures. But instead of being cooperative like bees, they're competitive. So they have a social structure, they have a hierarchy, but the stronger wasps will take food from the weaker wasps. <coughs> And the male wasps are very cruel to the queen wasp. So the queen wasp actually doesn't want to mate. She tries to fly and get away. 
and instead of continuing the hive. So there's great exploitation and cruelty between the classes and between the genders. So when one is doing detached work, one has to have a designation, a label. One has to be able to say, I'm an electrician, I'm a banker, I'm a doctor, I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm a mother. One has to, in order to work in a detached way, one has to know what work to do. The problem is that when we have a label, a designation, then we can think, my label is better than your label. And we become exploitive. Then we can go look for the essence of life in the eastern part of the city. This is the path of connecting with the divine through loving service, through devotional service. This is the path that we teach here in the Hare Krishna movement. So this is a very nice path because it gets to the root of our desire to exploit the world. It, it deals with the most essential feature of our materialistic tendencies by instead of being an exploiter, uh, instead we become a lover. We actually love the divine, we love nature instead of trying to exploit it. We work in harmony with truth until our heart melts. Here we have a nice a melting heart. Uh, and again, we regain our natural position in the cosmos. And the main process here is chanting the holy names of the Lord, and particularly singing and dancing. As you see, we do a lot of that here in the Hare Krishna movement. Uh, singing the holy name and dancing and, and like that. But even here there is a danger. Maybe you can see him in the back. Can you see the danger in the back? So, you know, in the old societies, they would use elephants for working, especially for harvesting lumber. Because elephants, instead of machines, you don't need to make a road through the forest, and you can only harvest the trees that you really need. So they're a much more ecological way of harvesting lumber. And elephants are wonderful creatures. They're very intelligent, and they have a very good memory, they're very loving. They tend to always be loving and kind towards their trainers and anyone who's taken care of them. But elephants also have a, a very strange feature that is not found in many creatures among the animal kingdom. So in most animals, the female of the species has a regular time of fertility, but the males do not. So with the elephant, they, the males are fertile at any time, but they also have times of increased fertility and desire, but it's not at a regular time. And when the bull elephant goes into this time, which has, it's called must, so there's a liquid called temperin that comes out of their forehead, and they urinate constantly, their back legs are always wet, they're very sensitive to sound and to movement, and they can become wild. They forget all their loving relationships. They may even kill their trainer. They will knock down a house. They'll destroy a garden. They'll destroy anything. And when the young bull goes into must, the older bulls get out of his way and says, you can have all the female elephants I'm getting out of here. Uh, so in the old societies, the simple societies where they worked with elephants, they would notice the very first sign of an elephant going into must, and immediately they stop giving all food, and they don't even give much water. And after two, three days, it, it goes away. In the modern Western world, where the elephants in zoos or in circuses, instead of doing that, they put the bull who goes into must in a very strong cage. But then must lasts for weeks or sometimes even months. So this elephant in must is a metaphor for criticizing other seekers of the essence, criticizing other spiritually minded beings that becomes just like this maddened bull elephant that destroys our beautiful garden of devotion. And rather, as soon as our mind starts becoming critical, as soon as we see those first signs of the mind becoming like a bull elephant in must, immediately we should starve that critical tendency. And then it will go away very quickly. So once we make a decision, 
to seek the essence of life through love and devotion. We will now turn to the metaphors of Raghunath Das Goswami, just sometimes called uh, Das Goswami. And I was teaching uh, this whole book last time I was here in Slovenia. So this is just a very brief overview of some of his metaphors. So he says, when you decide to take up the search for the essence of life through loving devotional service, you need to make sure that you always have great love and affection for all your teachers on the path. You need to have love and affection for the sacred mantras, for the holy name, not to just do these ritualistically. To have love for the sacred places, like this one, that act as a portal or a connection to the spiritual. And love for humility, love for the process of surrender, love for the process of giving up our exploitive egoistic mentality. And he takes us through four steps of metaphors which we have to be careful of in giving up our ego, our anger, our arrogance, and our pride. The first is in the form of sound. So sound created the world. What was the sound that created the world? What? Oh, you can do better than that. What was the sound that created the world? That was a little better. So you know, sound also creates our own life. I'm sure many of you have studied this, that how we think, how we speak, actually generates our life, yes? You aware of this? So if we're engaged in hearing gossip and politics and materialistic talk and negative talk, then the metaphor for that kind of sound is like a prostitute who appears to be attractive but simply wants our money. And you can see this prostitute is taking his wealth right out of the heart. When we're not careful about the sounds we make, when we're critical of ourselves, critical of others, when we're just engaged in mundane talk, then that mundane talk, though appearing very attractive, takes that wealth of devotion out of our heart. In the same way, talks about, oh, I just want to lose myself, I just want some kind of liberation where I lose myself, is the metaphor of a tiger who eats our very self, which is really a loving being. We conquer the prostitute and tiger by having a jewel of service. This is where the sounds we make are beneficial. They're in service. Whatever we hear, whatever we speak, should be for the genuine benefit of ourselves and others. Having this kind of a jewel protects us from the prostitute and the tigers of negative talk. Then what about our actions? Even if our talk is proper, we may not be behaving properly. We may say, I want this, I have this goal, but our actions may not be in line. I mean, we know, I shouldn't watch that, but we may watch it anyway. We know, I shouldn't eat that, but we may eat it anyway. We know, I shouldn't do that, but we may do it anyway. The metaphor for this kind of behavior is like highway robbers, thieves on the road. And these thieves are our own lust, our anger, our envy, our greed, our illusion, and our madness. And the ropes they have are made up of these actions that are against our own ideals, that work against what we want to achieve. But these ropes, it's like they're around our neck, pulling us. Ah, come do this. I don't want to do it. Come do it anyway. Right? And we just feel helplessly dragged around by our own anger, our own fear, our own lust, our own greed. The cure for this is to call for the help of those people on the spiritual path who are free from this problem. By their instructions, by their example, by their guidance, they can also help us get free of these things which are pulling us to what we ourselves do not honestly desire. Then there's a level of pride in the mind. This is where we fool ourselves about our own motives, where we rationalize to ourselves ways of thinking and being and doing that are actually in opposition to the spiritual path. We are basically fooling ourselves. 
On the gross level, our behavior may all be beautiful, but if our mind is not peaceful and happy, if our mind feels like it's burning in dissatisfaction, then we have some inner way in which we are not really having the right motive, the right way of acting, and we're rationalizing it to ourselves. This burning dissatisfaction we feel in the mind is compared in the metaphor to taking a bath in the burning urine of a very big donkey. So these are activities we think are purifying us, mentalities we think are purifying us. These are not activities which appear to be against our ideals. These are activities which appear to be good to us, or ways of thinking that appear to be good. We think they're cleaning us, but actually they are burning us. The cure for this is to take a bath in the ocean of love. What this means is that we open our mind to the divine, we open our mind to Krishna, we ask Krishna to reveal to us what is the real nature of our behavior and motives. And once we see that real nature, we can easily let go of the obstacles in our life. Then there is the, uh, the problem within the heart, within our deepest core. There, Raghunath Das Goswami says, we have metaphorically a dead dog sitting on our dinner plate. This dead dog is the honor and praise we receive for being a very spiritual person. Also metaphorically in the heart is a wild dancing woman who represents the desire to enjoy this honor and praise for being spiritual. And the real ladies of love in the background, they will not enter a heart where this sinking dead dog and this crazy lady are dancing. The wild woman is dancing with her boyfriend named Deceit. He represents the fact that when we want to be honored for being spiritual, we will not be honest about our own failings, our own doubts, and our own difficulties. This desire to be honored for our spirituality is at the root of everything that is false and difficult on the spiritual path. We get rid of this by serving the great saints and generals on the spiritual path. Instead of wanting to be honored as a saint, instead we serve the saints. By this humble service, they can elevate us beyond this last tinges of pride. Then, with honest humility, we can go and to the Lord, we can go to the saintly persons and say, I have so many difficulties, there's so many obstacles, there's so much confusion, there's so much doubt, it's just like a huge ocean. I don't know how I'll ever get through it. Please give me help, give me mercy. Then something wonderful happens. Can you all chant to three in Slovenian? And then this big ocean of difficulty becomes simply, oops, that didn't work there. Um, it didn't work. I have to do it on my computer. I don't know how to do it here. Anyway, that whole, oh, there it is. It worked. Ah, okay. That whole big ocean of difficulty becomes just like a tiny puddle that we can cross over. And then we actually experience the essence of life. Our life becomes full of joy and light. We then enter into the garden of sacred fragrance. There we realize what is the nature of the divine, what is our real form, what is our real personality. And then, although we may appear to continue to work and live in the world like an ordinary person, internally we are fully spiritualized and everywhere we see the divine and it is like we are drinking glowing nectar at every step. So thank you very much for taking this journey with me. This was all done by the grace of our founder, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Uh, now we're going to have the RT ceremony. As I said, I have written this novel based on these metaphors. So I took these metaphors and I created a story around them about how to attain the essence of life.
Um, so if any of you want one, please come see me right after the presentation. I, I'm very sorry that of the 40 copies I brought here, I only have three copies left. So um, if you want one and can't get one now, they are available from Bhaktivedanta Library Services in Radhadesh and also from Amazon. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hi Krishna, thank you very much for uh, such a wonderful presentation. Torej kot je Mati Jurmina rekla, na velevali bomo zgor Aratikov oziroma Arati se že odvija. Zdaj 